figure. So conversation. And Tagalog ba? Is this the, we'll try to speak in Tagalog, is this correct? Or... Isa lang, no, Brian? Basta ano yeah. na lang. Yeah, uh, I that think should be fine also. Yeah, if kasi may mga, may mga words na hindi natin pwedeng gawin Tagalog. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, go ahead, All right. guys. Let's go. All right. Uh, Maram salamat, folks. Uh, so here we are. Kasama po natin si Jenica Dizon, who's there uh, representing the Philippines dyan sa COP26 discussion. Of course, huwag natin kalimutan. Itong mga discussion na yan ay multi-stakeholders. No? So involved dyan mga government agencies, non-government agencies, experts around the world. Dahil po napakataas yung stakes. These are very high stakes uh, negotiations and discussions. So dapat lahat involved, participatory yung process of negotiation. Uh, kaya we're very glad to have with us today uh, Jenica Dizon. Right, uh, who's uh, one of our country representatives, and she's gonna help us to shed light dito sa what is at stake, what policies, sticking points ang dapat pag uh, pag-usapan natin. Ano yung ginagawa ng mga major countries, major powers? Uh, how are we doing in terms of adaptation and mitigation mechanisms? And dito sa Pilipinas, kamo sa naman yung government natin. What policies should we do? And of course, anong gagawin naman ang ang, ang, ang mga ordinary mamamayan, at saka especially mga youth no ahead of elections. Is this is the environment and climate change issue important enough for us to put it at the center of our election discussion next year? So thank you very much, Jenica, for, for joining us today. So kamusta naman dyan sa COP26? What is the general mood? Are people cautiously optimistic? Is there a lot of frustration? Or is there kind of a uh, kind of a light at the end of the tunnel that we might get at least on paper no? some some important agreements para we can move forward? Because it's annual, naman yan. Kaya COP26, hindi naman to one and for forever but every year we need to make major moves before it's too late no so so uh, Jenica can you give us some overview of what's the general mood there well the general mood I would say I would agree with you is cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. I think because we skipped a year um I think crucial is on COP26 ngayon kasi mm -hmm. every five years bumabalik yung mga bansa <clears throat> para i-review ka nilang mga commitments. So yung commitment central to dun sa discussion about um, in, in the negotiations, di ba? Kung magka iba-iba yung contribution ng mga bansa mm -hmm. sa global greenhouse gas emissions. So, Ito yung basis sa Paris Climate Agreement, right? I mean, yes, uh, ang reference point po natin yung 2016 Paris Climate Agreement kung saan nagsangayon yung yung all, almost all major countries around the world no na mag-pledge sila ng specific no uh, reductions dun sa kanila carbon emissions para ma-avoid natin yung increase beyond 2 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. uh, compared dun sa pre-industrial revolution level. So just to be clear, ito yung reference point natin. So from there, we are working out yung details kasi the devil is in the details. Pero ang sinasabi nila, 1.5 pa lang, code red na, di ba? Yun ang lumabas sa huling report. So IPCC. tayo pa lang ngayon, 1.1 degrees. Celsius na ating naramdaman, pero di ba sa Pilipinas pa lang, ramdam na ramdam mo yung epekto ng pagbabago ng klima at yung naging pagbabago sa panahon natin, di ba, stronger drought, talagang matinding La Nina at El Nino events na talagang nakakasira ng buhay at ng kabuhayan. So, high stakes, sabi mo nga itong COP26 at dahil every five years nire-review yung commitment at kung paano nila gagawin, di ba, madaling mag-commit, madaling magsabi ng mga numero, pero kung paano nila gagawin yun at kung paano tutulungan tayo ng mga developed countries. Kasi kung iisipin mo, hindi naman, yun nga, sabi natin, hindi equal ang ang share, hindi equal ang ang kasalanan sa, sa, sa ating crisis ngayon. So, merong commitment, nandun din yun sa Paris, na tulungan ng developed countries, ang developing countries tulad natin na maka-adjust so, through climate climate demand. So, isa rin yun sa isang discussion kasi may 100 billion na committed pero hindi pa rin yun nakikita or hindi pa rin yun talagang ibinibigay dun sa mga developing countries hindi lang para mag-adapt hindi lang para mag-mitigate pero para ma-cover loss and damage para mabigyan ng um, mabigyan ng assistance yung pagkawala ng, ng buhay at ng kabuhayan. So, I would say generally cautiously optimistic, pero mahirap. I mean, ang negotiations, formal negotiations next week pa. So, maraming right. plenary events, maraming speech, pero mahikita talaga natin, ang sabi mo nga, the devil is in the details, next mm -hmm. week kung paano talaga yon lalakarin at mapapatupad. Right, kasi medyo more symbolic, general, yung, yung agreements natin back in 2016 in Paris. But now we have to really go to the details. At saka usapan pera yan. No? So there you really need details. You need signature. You need, hindi lang pledge. We want money coming in because many countries need that. No, before we go dun sa case ng Philippines, kasi napaka-vulnerable countries tayos, 
multiple indices, top 10 tayo in the world, HSBC, the Global Risk Index. So clear yung Philippines very vulnerable. We can discuss that later on. But going back again dun sa global level, no? Uh, of course, ang principle dito is common but differentiated responsibility. So lahat tayo may responsibility. But yung mga mas malaki yung contribution dun sa carbon emissions, sa ting greenhouse gases, since the Industrial Revolution era, mas malaki of course yung kanilang responsibility. But of course, things get interesting, uh, Jenica, because if you look at the numbers, while it's true na yung Western countries and later on Japan, no, I major contributors to carbon emission and then later on Russia and Soviet Union, the reality is that if you look at the a uh, huge part of contribution to overall concentration on carbon emission. A lot of that actually happened in the last 34 years we, within our lifetime. And this was the era of rise of China and, of course, to a lesser degree, rise of India and other major emerging markets, Brazil, uh, so on and so forth, right? So, so kaya nga, ang malaking sticking issue dito is hindi lang yung pledge ng mga mayayaman na industrialized country. I think we had President Jos Joseph Biden going there, apologizing for Trump withdrawing from the agreement. Uh, talking about close to $2 trillion in assistance. He has made pledges on the part of the U.S. But yung isang malaking issue dito, hindi nagpakita si President Xi Jinping ng China. And China, based on the latest data, is not only the largest contributor of carbon emission by far, no? Uh, but even on a per capita basis, kasi syempre sabi nila, malaking population ng China. But even on a per capita basis, napakalaki, above global average ang China. So China is a big part of the solution as much as it is a big part of the problem, many would say. Kamusta naman uh, yung, yung hidwaan na nakikita natin in the past pa lang, no? sa Denmark pa lang, Copenhagen back in the days, uh, between uh, developing countries and developed countries. Meron pa rin bang US versus China element or medyo may solidarity na among countries or is it China versus both developing countries and developed countries? Kamusta naman yung geopolitics dyan at saka yung the big China aspect, China question? Well, yun nga, mahirap. The written statement lang submit nila, so mahirap yung back and forth. And I would say it's hard to comment geopolitically kung ano yung general sentiment kasi nagpakita naman din sila ng commitment to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And kung iisipin natin, related pa rin lahat. Kahit historically, historical responsibility ng developed countries yung mm -hmm. naging industrial revolution and yung cost ng climate crisis. Per capita, na-mention mo nga, malaki pa rin. Ma kailangan pa rin i-discuss kasi, di ba, kaya rin lumiit yung emissions ng ibang developed countries ay dahil right. in-outsource nila yung trabaho sa China. Yeah. Yung greenhouse gas emissions na pinag-uusapan natin is yung pinoproduce lang sa bansa mo pero yung kinoconsume galing sa China, di ba? Right. Kahit developed countries, the UK for example, ang laki na ng ibawas nila pero in a way, in-outsource nila yung emissions nila nasa ibang bansa dahil doon sa bansa ng China pinoproduce, minamanufacture, yung kinoconsume dito at yun, hindi pa yung natitake into account kaya isa rin yun sa mga dapat pag-usapan kasi Right. Hindi lang, hindi lang, di ba maraming, sa atin lang din eh, maraming made in China. So hindi lang sila per capita emission. Pero lahat ng pinoproduce, ina-outsource sa kanila na ginagawa, right. kailangang pag-usapan. So I think these, these things, yung maliliit na nuances, as you said, the right. details, ang kailangang lumabas sa negotiations at sa right. mga talks next week. Yeah, I mean, of course, this is a as a global factor yung China, di ba? So obviously, that pushes up their their emission levels. But of course, one concern with China is yung coal production nila ay mataas pa rin. No? At nakita natin, nag-pick up pa yan in recent months nung nag-increase ng coal prices. Uh, so if you look at China, parang mixed picture. No? On one hand, some very important developments nang nangyari, nag-pledge sila, I think, by 2060. They moved towards carbon neutrality. So pag sinabi natin carbon neutrality, hindi ibig sabihin wala kang carbon emission. Ibig sabihin, meron kang gagawin na pang offset dun sa pinaproduce mo. So renewables, carbon capture technology, right? Or mag-reforest ka para ma-capture yan, di ba? So, so China, in fairness to them, have made the pledge to 2060. And knowing the Chinese, when they, they have targets, they're going to meet that in one way or another. No, hindi lang bola bola yan. So we're very glad about that. And China has been massively producing solar panel uh, among other renewables. So malaking contribution yan. But, but yun nga, yung Tony Xi Jinping, at least the speech we saw, that, I mean, he didn't attend, but based on speeches that he was still pushing the burden also on the developed countries. Now, you also do have to do your part. So I think ang worry siguro dito is that yung big countries, kasi ito yung problema natin, the big countries are not only rich, may mga developing big countries also, no? And this brings us to the other giant or the, uh, the, 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 the other elephant in the room, which is India, no? So uh, there's a lot of uh, China criticism over the years, but in fairness to China, as you mentioned, they, their nuances there, and then China, of course, is also creating a lot of renewables. But India could be another major source of problems. So many are saying that as China moves towards 
developing more advanced technology and renewable technology, countries like India and sub-Saharan African countries could be the next major wave of carbon em em emitters in the world. So nakita natin, I think Prime Minister Modi made the pledge by 2070, but medyo kapos yata yung, yung mga pledges ng India. Ano naman yung comments about India dyan or discussions about India? So in general, di ba? <clears throat> Kung ang commitment to until 2070. Ang sinasabi ng mga tao, wala na tayong until 2070. Medyo finish na. But 2030. Oh, di ba? Di ba? Kahit sa China eh, di ba? 2030, 2030 yung sinasabing deadline. And at this rate, yung current emission reduction commitment, hindi enough para 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 umabot nga sa 2 degrees Celsius. So kahit ano pa yung maging commitment mo, you know, I mean, you have to give it to them. Honest sila na hindi kaya. Pero hindi pwede, di ba? Kasi wala eh. Hindi, hindi pwedeng until 2017 mag net zero. Kasi wala na tayong oras. At, at yun actually, ang talagang binibigyan ng, sinatry bigyang pansin dito sa mga climate strikes na nangyayari. Kaya, as you mentioned, importante din yung, yung individual and yung collective, yung grassroots, yung multi-stakeholder action para magkaroon ng pressure sa mga gobyerno to make them more ambitious about their commitment. Right. Thanks, Jenica. I mean, one of the things that uh, kind of got my attention, again, of course, there are nuances there is, for instance, United Kingdom, I think, is the most aggressive one in terms of their target. Dun sa kanilang batas, nila that by 2035, they have to reduce their carbon emission by 78%. Joseph Biden discussed around 50% reduction uh, within the next 10 to 15 years. So while we can talk about 100% carbon neutrality 50 years down the road, 30 years down, but many countries are making that pledges already in the next 10 to 15 years. Kasi yun daw yung crucial window eh. If before 2030, mm hindi -hmm. natin ayusin yan, we might go to 3 degrees. And from there, medyo apocalyptic levels na yung pinag-usapan natin. Large parts of Earth can be completely uninhabitable in 100 years from now pag hindi natin ayusin yan. So I think as much as we want to talk about 100% neutrality, uh, reducing 50% in the next 10 to 15 years in shorter term is also very crucial because the window diba, is, is closing really for the world based on IPCC studies and other studies that we see. Yes, yeah, so, oh, kailangan matapos na yung peak and from that peak, talagang bumaba na pagkatapos. Right. So, I think, yun, medyo pragmatic siyempre yung conversation kasi imagine mo, di ba, halos dalawang daang bansa ang nagkitipon para mag-agree. Kaya naintindihan mo rin kahit pa paano na, you know, sabi mga tao, di ba, 26 years na yung COP pero parang palala pa rin ang palala yung climate change, yung climate crisis. Pero maintindihan mo na yung nuances nga na mahirap pag-agree yung dalawang daang bansa in, in, into a singular commitment. Pero yun ang kailangan dahil wala na tayong oras. Right. But Jenica, on a more positive note, so medyo understandable naman yung mga ganitong hidwan. And of course, there's some governments who want to survive until the next election. So if they make big pledges, baka hindi na sila manalo next election. So we can understand also the domestic politics, especially in democratic countries. No, Ibang usapan yung China, they can make longer uh, terms. But what are the good things that happen? So we heard that I think uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson discussed the deforestation issue with Brazil and South uh, Indonesia. Kasi malaking issue din yung, ano, yung, yung deforestation eh especially some of the methods being used uh, in Indonesia in, in, in grazing of mga big forests. So you're not only killing yung lungs of the earth, you're also emitting carbon. So double damage yung ginagawa. So mahalaga din yung role of other developing countries like Indonesia, Brazil, which are very, very, you know, very biodiverse and important countries na hindi masyadong pinag-usapan in the past. So it seems there's been some development there. And then pwede tayo mag-follow up din dun sa sinabi mo na $100 billion pledge. So I remember this has been up for discussion for for a few years is there more clarity kasi dalawang aspect yon mitigation so bawasan po natin yung emission natin para hindi lalong lumala pero meron din tayong adaptation so dapat magbigay ka ng pera at resources at technology dun sa mga vulnerable na countries uh, syempre mga katulad ng Maldives baka wala na sila by the end of this century kung aakyat yung sea levels as as you know mainit nagme-melt yung icebergs tataas yung sea level yung mga isla wala na yan mga Maldives parts of Bangladesh Manila could be vulnerable, Jakarta, uh, Calcutta, so, so on and so forth, right? Ano naman yung development on the front of uh, yung, yung pledges, yung assistance, yung, yung adaptation mechanisms? Uh, is there, is, is there, are there signs of, uh, of progress there? Uh, uh, you, you think, Jenica? Well, I think huge step forward na yung sinabi mo na yung pinakaunang naging agreement is yung promise to stop and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. Kasi nga sabi mo, hindi lang 
hindi double damage yung nangyayari pero malaki yun ang contribution. So part ng climate finance conversation ngayon kasama sa adaptation and mitigation ang nature-based solution. So babalik tayo sa talagang natural na um, responsibility at na ibibigay ng natural ecosystem sa atin. So in nature-based solutions kasama doon yung pagpapalaki ng ating mga kagubatan, pag-protectan nito at yung pag-acknowledge. So ito yung isa sa mga talagang inilalagay sa mga layunin yung pag-acknowledge the role ng mga IT communities, yung role ng indigenous people so right. in being conservers, protectors of the environment, and also how they are the most severely affected. So I think merong 14 billion deals right. from the public and private sector backing the protection of the forest. Kasi kahit China is also an emitter, malaki hmm. ng kanilang forest cover. So China and Brazil, I think 85% of the world's um, forest. So there's huge um there's there's been a huge agreement on that and hopefully it will set the tone for for more optimistic and ambitious commitments in terms of finance so hindi lang contributions yung pinag-uusapan right. dito pero importante is kung paano ipapalaganap paano ibibigay yung climate finance nga na committed na from before right uh, Jenica, uh, we you discussed the private sector we have heard uh, jeff bezos talking about you know, making contribution to this. We have seen airlines, Delta Airlines, among others, saying that they're going to go carbon neutral in the coming decades. Kamusta naman yung role ng mga big corporations? Kasi malaking pera mga yan. I mean, sometimes, some of them are richer than total countries. I mean, like Elon Musk has more money than entire Pakistan by some estimates, right? So, kamusta naman ito mga billionaires and, and, and big companies? Uh, are they, do they care? Or are they also helping in the situation? Or are they going to be part of the negotiation process and all? Um, malaki, naging malaking issue yan leading up to COP. Mala, mm-hmm. Maraming mga naging rally against you know, big fossil fuel companies. Diba? Isa yan sa mga mayayaman. I mean, fossil fuels, you have, dyan, dyan tayo, dyan, dyan talaga lumaki yung, yung greenhouse gas emissions right. because it's what's driven industrial, the industrial revolution and improvement to some degree. Pero hindi right. sila welcome dito. So if you look in the news, nagkaroon ng mga maraming rallies against Shell, mm-hmm. against banks even mga right. financial institutions because people want banking, financial institutions to stop funding dirty coal, to dirty stop funding coal. fossil fuels. Diba? Dapat ngayon, iniisip na natin, pinag-uusapan, pinagpaplanuhan kung paano yung energy transition kasi part din yan ng mitigation. Diba? Right. Paano tayo, paano babawasan yung greenhouse gas emissions? So kailangan yung top emitters, kahit sa Pilipinas, transport diba? and energy production. So, yan yung mga kailangang pinag-uusapan dito at kung ano yung magiging assistance ng mga bansa para sa atin. And huge yung role ng private sector dito dahil sila ang nag-drive din ng industry. Right. Sila ang may kakayahan para magpondo, di ba? To some degree. And if there's commitment on their end, commitment on the government, then I think I'd be more optimistic about how to operationalize the commitments that the different countries here are giving. Right. Kasi yung public-private partnership, mahalaga talaga yung issue na yan. No? At nakita natin in recent years, meron yung mga tinatawag na activist shareholders. So we see even in big companies, I think some of the big oil companies, may mga activist shareholders na sila pushing for reduction of carbon emission. I think we got BlackRock, some of the big financial institutions in, in the East Coast, in the U.S. also pushing for reduction of investments or di- disinvestment no? from some of the dirty uh you know fossil fuel uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, carbon producing companies and all so in fairness it seems even yung mga kapitalista medyo na realize nila delikado tong situation existential risk no uh we're facing now let's go to the philippines because we have seen some of the reports that are very bo- uh, troublesome so nakita natin dun sa department of finance report na habang napakaliit yung carbon emission ng Pilipinas eh, kasi very diversified yung ano natin. We have geothermal, we have many sources for re- uh, energy production, hindi lang uh, coal, eh, among others. Uh, you know, Philippines lost more than a billion dollars nung 2020 lang because of yung mga typhoons and all. And the numbers could reach 10 billion dollars in the coming decade no? kung hindi naayos yung sitwasyon. Doon sa report ng World Bank and IMF nakita natin na there's a 40% chance no uh, na you know within the next 50 years uh, you know trillions of pesos will be lost from from our coffers because of the damages that are happening and what up to 1 million Filipinos could be displaced hindi lang thousands hundreds of, but million Filipinos could be displaced if if hindi maayos itong climate change um so kamusta naman yung position ng Philippine government so we are not the bad guys here. We're kind of like the innocent bystanders, you can say, by, by some estimates. But uh, is the Philippines also moving the right direction on both fronts in terms of mitigation? 
Uh, are we also trying to diversify our maybe stop coal factories? I think ADB is going to help us with that. Uh, are we going to do more renewables? And also, uh, are we going to aggressively also push na tulungan tayo na ibang bansa no? para magkaroon tayo na adaptation uh, mechanisms and, and technology? Well, I think meron lang tayong gustong i-correct na uh, misconception. No? Na kahit, you know, globally, maliit nga tayong emitter, right. but you would say pwedeng tayong innocent bystander. Right. In terms of low and middle income countries, nasa top 25% na tayo ranking in terms of our emissions. So, in a way, as, as a middle income developing country, right. malaki na rin actually ang greenhouse gas emissions ng Pilipinas. So, significantly increasing siya throughout the decade. And that's why there's huge push for right. clean transport and renewable energy transition. So, yun ang malaking issue ngayon sa atin kasi developing middle-income country na tayo. So, hindi tayo tulad ng Maldives na talaga ang totally innocent. Kung tutuos right. din, malaki na rin ang development na nangyari sa atin and largely because right. of our few fossil fuel dependence. So, I think yan ang magiging right. malaking discussion. And coal factories. At- no, if I'm not mistaken, we have also built some coal factories, dirty coal, in the past. A decade or so. If, uh, so this has been an issue for environmentally. So uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for for pointing that out. As innocent as we may be, we're but we are also not doing our part, perhaps, in making the situation uh, better, right? Mm-mm. Parang we need to shift and stop hiding behind. You know, all vulnerable tayo, tayo yeah. pero contributor na rin tayo ngayon because in yes. terms of our ranking, nasa top twenty five percent na tayo. There's been huge commitment from the government, the right? 75 right. increase a decrease in reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions, pero 2.71% lang ang unconditional. Ibig sabihin, 2.71% lang yung talagang mabudgetan ng gobyerno or bibig or part na ng existing projects in terms of emissions. Yung more than ilan naman natira, 70 74% noon ay right. conditional. Ibig sabihin nakadepende sa magiging tulong throughout the climate finance team. So, yun ang talagang kailangan bantayan kasi kung hindi tayo tutulungan, ibig sabihin ba, hindi tayo gagalaw? So, yun ang talagang kailangang stronger yeah. ambition na kinakampanya. Kailangan so, ng stronger ambition at no? the national level. Right. So, Jenica, you're saying we have to be more proactive because thank you very much for pointing that out that uh, indeed, actually, to correct that we're not that innocent also, but we're also, but unfortunately, we're also a bystander in the sense that Yung, yung, yung influence natin ay limited on a global level. But we have to have the moral ascendancy, right? If we're going to demand other big countries to make big sacrifices, tapos tayo mismo nagpakita rin tayo ng initiative, no? So siguro mahalaga na i-raise din ito. Uh, what about on the front of getting financing and help? Para, kasi hindi naman mura po na i-stop natin yung mga coal factory na ginawa natin. Hindi naman uh, cheap yun. So, so the transition process is going to be hard and expensive. We need to uh, revamp yung ating infrastructure. For instance, electric cars. A lot of them, Tesla cannot even you know, be acceptable in the Philippines pa. So medyo backward tayo on that level. No? So we need to spend billions, no? a potential of dollars over the coming years to get that together. Uh, is there any indication or at least conversation sa inyo, sa mga... Uh, you know, people involved in these issues that, you know, is there a roadmap for the Philippines in that direction? And are you optimistic that at least under the next admin, kasi yun nga, patapos ng Duterte admin, so really the conversation should be about the next administration. Is there a roadmap uh, on that front? I would say there would be. There's a developing one. Um, and right. I also welcome um, the presence of Secretary Dominguez. Diba? Parang, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's the first time that our Department of Finance Right. Um, secretary actually is attending the negotiations, and I welcome that as, as a welcome as a show of commitment for the Philippines to secure climate financing for mm. its conditional right. um, commitments. Right. Because it's mahita mo yung mga tao nagtatanong bakit walang taga climate change commission. Right. It is uh, a valid point, but at the same time, it's also good na Isak Dominguez is here to really push for climate finance because it is part of the commitment and the responsibility of development of developed countries. So hopefully, we are able to secure that. But at the same time, we need to ramp up our own unconditional commitment, and that through, as you mentioned, although mahal, your energy transition and your transition to cleaner transport at the same time, all focus on nature-based solutions. No, hindi lang right. tayo puro tech. There's existing nature-based solutions that right. we can do and invest in. You mean geothermal, tide, uh, yung mga ganun? Is that what you're saying? Or are, are you saying that 
yung mga methods of farming or agriculture or, or building our houses could be more nature friendly or nature sustainable something like that what do you by mean by nature based solution it, it's really um, focusing on the ecosystem services that our existing right. environment has the natural environment so in tree forest cover for example giving funding to IT communities for example to take care of forests diba in this na i-clear yan susunugin for development maintain it as a carbon sink diba right. our wetlands are also have a huge um, contribution to be a carbon sink even blue carbon yung mga dagat yung coral so really right. protecting the environment investing the environment is helping us reduce greenhouse gas emissions so you can do both invest in technology invest in the natural environment and the caretakers of the environment which are you know closest to them are our IT community so that's what really you know us from the civil society want to put at the forefront and want to push more and obviously also push for climate justice you know mm-hmm. we're still a vulnerable country and talagang tayo yung mas nakaranas ng epekto ng matinding yeah. pagbabago mm-hmm. yes disproportionately yeah. so yeah. That- climate justice and climate finance go hand in hand in that sense Right. Uh, Jenica, on the last point, Siguro, uh, I mean, thank you for raising the point of climate justice because even within the Philippines, the ones who will be most affected are people from the indigenous communities. No, Unfortunately, uh, the, the injustice is not only global, but also on the national and micro level. So on the last point, what should be the policies, na, concrete policies we should do? Because no matter what happens in a negotiation, even if we keep it at 2 to 2.5% no uh in terms of the increase in in temperature uh there're going to be super storms there're going to be hurricanes there're going to be huge events na so many Philippines will be affected in one way or another any more concrete steps that we should do in terms of you know uh you know uh, in terms of urban planning in terms of you know zoning uh things like that and and and, and in relation to that ano naman yung role ng Philippine youth no Uh, especially you know first time voters as they get more involved in politics what can the youth do in terms of contributing uh, to helping with the with, with the mitigation and adaptation vis-a-vis the climate change issue so first is really try to educate yourself diba parang ito medyo high level technical parang baka hindi mo siya napapansin talaga ng mga tao kasi parang komplikado pakinggan pero kung iintindihin mo tayo bilang individual talagang naaapektuhan at, at bilang isang bansa kita natin kung paano yung epekto nitong mga sakuna nitong matinding pagtuyot sa ating mga magsasaka so kita natin diba climate change is a threat to our very existence in terms of food security in terms of water access the very basic needs we need to to exist so so knowing this important na the youth keep pushing for keep putting pressure into their leaders sabi nila wala namang napapala yung mga pagrarally yung mga pagte-strike pero hindi di ba it helps put the, the conversation into the consciousness of the general public it picked up by media talagang mas napapalaganap yung kaalaman ng mga tao dahil may mga nagpupunta sa kalsada para magrally at magpressure sa ating mga leaders na nandito para kumuha ng commitment at magbigay ng kanilang mga pangakuran and strategy to really operationalize. Kasi madaling magsabi, madaling mag-commit, pero yung mga, kung paano ba nila tayo operationalize, ang talagang kailangan natin yung bantayan. Yung compliance, no? yung enforcement ng compliance, napakamalaga. Right? At the end of the day, and implementation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, so yun talagang kailangan natin bantayan. And, and knowing that, you know, there's a huge new voting population base of the right. youth knowing the priorities for them. Kasi diba, ito minsan, sasabihin nila yung mga matatanda, hindi na sila masyadong matatagal. Diba, whatever the decisions the elders, our older you know, leaders make, it's really the youth who will stand to be the most affected. It's really the youth future that's at stake. And that's why it, it's really important for the youth to get involved because whatever decisions happen here, it's us who will get the most affected, who will, who will bear the brunt or bear, you know, a more optimistic and hopeful future. So whatever comes out, we really need to put pressure into our leaders. And that's why it's so important for the people who will vote for to put climate change at the forefront of their agenda. Kasi you can make so many policies, pero kung yung very existence, yung, yung, yung pagbuhay mo, yung pagkabuhay mo sa bansa, ay, ay under threat. Di ba? Para saan pa yung ibang polisiya kung, kung hindi mo may ensure na meron kang tubig pagkain na makukuha. So it is very important. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Jenica, for, for giving us an overview of the high-stakes, multi-stakeholder negotiation, Jensa COP26. It might seem technical, it might seem too highfalutin, but actually this is about an existential risk. And all of us, especially my younger ones and, and our children and grandchildren, 
they're going to depend on how effectively we're going to do this, especially within the next 10 years. So our window is really until 2030 to get this right. Marami Salamat. Thank you very much, Jenica, uh, for joining us. So there we are. We have an overview of that. Hopefully next week and all, we're going to have more interviews and discussions on this as final agreement and details come out. Marami Salamat, Jenica. God bless. Thank you very much.